Good morning and welcome to Urology Grand Rounds. It's really heartwarming to see so many across Michigan medicine and beyond join us for this important discussion. Today's presentation is part of our Teach Us Something series, where thought leaders across the academic spectrum, both within and outside of medicine, deliver a compelling and informative TED style talk. Today, given recent and past events, I thought we'd change the format just a little. The brutal and senseless killing of George Floyd last week has ignited long standing emotions among many and brought issues of race and racism into stark relief for all. Indeed, as Dr. Martin Luther King wrote in Letter from a Birmingham Jail, injustice anywhere is a threat to justice everywhere. This morning, we are honored to have Dr. Fermi Okanlami, Assistant Professor of Family Medicine and Physical Medicine and Rehabilitation and Director of, Adap Director of Adaptive Sports at the University of Michigan, and Dr. Randy Vince, first year NCI T32 Fellow in Urologic Oncology here in our department. We are also joined this morning by Dr. Michelle Carrick, Interim Chair, Professor, and the Larry S. Matthews, MD, Collegiate Professor of Orthopedic Surgery here at the University of Michigan. All three of our panelists are academic professionals from different backgrounds and are noted speakers on diversity, equity, and inclusion, among other topics. If you have questions for our speakers, I'd ask you to please post them in the chat box and we'll do our best to get to them. We fully realize that current social distancing measures prevent today's conversation from being an open discourse. Still, we view this as a beginning and int intend to plan similar events in the near future. To start, I'd like to ask Dr. Vince, Randy, if you could reflect a little bit about the impact of George Floyd's killing upon you and give us your thoughts uh, as they came to you um, after the event. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, first, thank you, Ganesh, for your leadership in pulling this event together. Um, I also wanna encourage people to post questions in the chat because I think all of the panelists, we all agree that this should be an open discussion. None of us wanna feel like we're talking at anyone. Um, but the, the one other thing before I kind of reflect on um, recent events is, you know, there's many people in this world that could be in this position right now. So, and I don't proclaim to be the world's expert on race, but you know, when it comes to being a black man in this country, I am an expert on that. And so I can speak on that. Um, so as I reflect on, you know, not just the George, George Floyd killing, but you know, everything that happened with Amy Cooper and then the history of this country, um, I have several emotions, you know, I, I kind of ran a spectrum of emotions over the past week anger, um, you know, the thought of me, my 18-year-old son being pulled over by cops and being subjected to police brutality it makes you very angry. You get disappointed because this is nothing new in this country. Um, and it seems as though of recent times, you know, people will protest and, you know, they'll speak out. But then three months later, it's back to business as usual. Um, I was sad, discouraged. Um, I had a sense of anxiety, uh, again, because, you know, my oldest son just turned 18 on May 24th, and we celebrated his birthday. And one of the conversations we had to have afterwards was, you know, remember the talk that we had about what you need to do in a step-by-step -step fashion after you get pulled over by a police officer, if you get pulled over by a police officer. So, I think all of those emotions were things that I felt more recently. I have had a, you know, a sense of encouragement with the protesters and that there's a diverse crowd within the protesters, but, you know, I will be the first one to say I'm, I'm admittedly pessimistic, you know, because this is, has been a cycle, you know, um, and it's not just these events, but it's my own personal experiences, plus knowing the history of this country. You know, I reflect on growing up in West Baltimore because that's where I'm from, and my own experience with the cops. You know, um, my first memory of, and let me say this before I kind of delve into that, I always struggle with these types of conversations because I don't, I, I never know how much to share and I don't want to make people uncomfortable, but I think at this time more than ever, people need to be uncomfortable because you know, there is progress to be made in uncomfortable positions. So you know, my first experience with 
police in Baltimore was, you know, a family member of mine was followed home. They said they saw this family member perform an illegal act, no evidence of it, and pretty much told our family, pay us money or we'll take them to jail. And so, you know, we ended up ponying up all the cash that we had as a family to keep this family member out of jail. And then they took off and they left. The other experience that I just reflect on is, you know, in Baltimore, we called them jump out boys. These were plain clothes office offices, you know, unmarked cars. And if you were walking down the street in the area that they thought was a high drug zone or a hot drug zone, then they would jump out their cars, guns drawn, pointing them in your face, throw you to the ground, search you. And, you know, the last experience I had with that was when I was 23 years old. I was walking down McKean Avenue in West Baltimore. Cops pulled out their guns as they jumped out the car. Uh, you know, in my mind, you're, it's a fight or flight type of reaction when people pull a gun in your face. And I just, I knew I didn't do anything wrong, so I didn't run. And so, you know, after the incident was over, they handed me my idea and said, have a, have a nice day. And how do you have a nice day after something like that? So, you know, given these recent events, given my personal experiences, given the history of, you know, things that have happened to people who look like me and not just like me, you know, um, people of, you know, across the spectrum, people of color, minorities, um, you know, people, women, you know, I think about the, not even a century ago, they would have lynching parties, you know, where they would mutilate the bodies of black men and black women and thousands of people would show up for that. So I think, you know, as I sit back and reflect all of these things, like constantly come into my mind. And I think all of these things should be brought to the forefront and, and everyone else's mind. And that is, will make people uncomfortable, but I think we can progress from being in that uncomfortable place. I'll t I don't want to take too much time, but I'll, I'll turn it over to the other panelists. Turn me. Thanks, Randy. Good morning, everybody. Once again, thanks, Ganesh, for doing this. Randy and I have had multiple conversations over the past few days, and as he said, we're not the experts on this, but we don't have to be the experts on this, because this isn't something that an expert needs to weigh in on to be able to talk about the impact that institutional and structural racism has had on not just our institution, but our country. And it sometimes, and many times, gives people pause when opportunities like this come and then they turn to the individuals that have been voiceless and marginalized and not listened to for years, and then look for answers to questions that have been answered years ago. And so I, I do want to say that this is something that many faculty, staff, and students have been saying for a long time. And many people are, are frustrated with feeling like the questions get asked of us when there is just the late, latest heightened event. But the fear, as Randy has said, and have other people have said in different conversations, is that what actual tangible, actionable change is going to happen? And unfortunately, in most of the conversations that I've had, people are pessimistic and they are not convinced that anything will actually change. So I say this because many people know me, and I'll be direct, I am not the quote unquote angry black man that is sort of depicted in these conversations. And and even the notion of the angry black man is one that I want to reject. But the truth is, I, I am often seen as the Uncle Tom. I'm often seen as the person that doesn't do enough because I haven't been the one burning down buildings. I've been the one trying to work within institutions. But when you continue to try to work within institutions and then you learn that those institutions do not value the work that you're trying to do, it becomes very easy to turn you into the angry black and so my hope for part of this was to not to contrast my, my, my background with Randy's, but was to talk about the fact that you have two black, young black faculty members here that have had different backgrounds, but that they came up in the same area. So my family also lived in the Baltimore area. So we're from Nigeria, which also gives me a certain position of privilege within this African-American demographic because I'm African, right? So I'm not African-American in the sense. I was born in Nigeria, both of my parents are Nigerian, but nobody cares about what that is when they just see the color of my skin. And so I get the same treatment when no one asks me where exactly I'm from, they just see what I look like when we get pulled over, right? But at that same time, 
I've been the person that's been called an Oreo, which for those of you that don't know, that's black on the outside and white on the inside, because the way that I talk or act or the things that I do, having gone to a preppy New England boarding school, Deerfield Academy in Western Massachusetts for high school, and Stanford University for college, and then University of Michigan for medical school, Yale for orthopedic surgery residency, Notre Dame for a master's degree, and then back to Michigan for my faculty position, I have been told that I'm whitewashed. And it's because I am not the person that acts as if I'm the angry black man. However, I'm still the person that has a nine-year-old son that just asked his mother the other day, mommy, did the police kill black people when you were growing up too? When you see our youth that are coming up today and the things that they are seeing and they're feeling, yet you have conversations with your colleagues who do not believe that it has anything to do with racism, who are ready to talk about how racism was a thing of the past, slavery was a thing of the past, and if you continue using that race card, then you are the one that's making this a conversation. When I tell people that I'm not choosing to use the race card, when the cards that I am dealt only have race plastered all over them, it's impossible to play on the other hand. And so the fact that even though, based on academic pedigree, based on the way that I talk or look or the people that I hang around with, I have not been the one seen as that angry black man. Today, I am that angry black man. But my goal is not to be angry. My goal is to have conversation about how this affects all of us. And unfortunately, because of COVID-19 and the socially distanced era that we're in, we can't be having this conversation in person where I can look around the room and see the people that are tuning out, see the people that are cooking breakfast for their kids, see the people that are multitasking and filling out their charts right now because they need to post charts. Because unfortunately, this work is not compensated based on time or money or resources. And people are going to have to do other things right now because we haven't been given the audience to make sure that this is something that can actually be so the hope is that at the end of the day, we see that this does not just affect Black people. Black people are just the latest casualty and have been the most regular casualty of the institutionalized racism, structural racism, and discrimination that happens. That's the foundation upon which our institutions and our nation was built upon. And until we're able to have that conversation directly, until we're able to acknowledge that, nothing's going to change. And I'm not pointing at the people in the room or the people on the, on the Zoom right now and saying it's your fault necessarily. I often tell people that the past is not your fault, but the future will be. Because if we can't then acknowledge the things that our past was and how it continues to have an impact on our present and our future, then we're not going to change it. And so, as we said, we're gonna give people opportunity to sort of share their backgrounds here, but I want to say that we acknowledge that this panel is not going to be all things to all people at all times right now. It started off as a mantle, but then everyone on the panel was very cognizant of the fact that we should not have a mantle when we're talking about this, and so we included others. We realized that we only have faculty on this panel and staff need to be represented. We acknowledge that we don't have any students on this panel right now, but I do want to point out that there will be a panel by Michigan Medicine tomorrow that is going to include faculty, staff, and student voices. And so that will be an opportunity to continue this conversation because it cannot start and stop here. This is just one of them. This is just Dr. Palapatu and Urology that have taken their opportunity to have this conversation. I know that orthopedics is gonna be following up with something this evening. Multiple departments are doing this, but it has to be a concerted effort where we aren't shying away from the true reasons why these things are happening. But at the same time, we take this chance to say, as Randy said, right now, today, we're talking about this because of what is happening to Black people in our country. But if we don't understand that there's an underlying theme that it happens to Black people, it happens to women, it happens to our LGBTQ community, it happens to those with disabilities, it happens to first generation and low income, it happens to all of the underrepresented marginalized groups that are not in the positions of power and privilege that then give them the audience and the voice to be able to speak up at times like this and not fear retribution, not feel afraid that they're going to lose their job, not be dubbed as the angry black man or angry black woman, not be dubbed as just that person that doesn't get it that's trying to take away from the focus that our priorities are. And so if these are our priorities, we should not be giving them audience once in a year. Because I'm gonna finish by this before I let Michelle talk. We had a very similar conversation like this about the incident that happened in our institution a while ago. 
We brought a whole bunch of people together and said that we care about our African-American community. Instances of racism and discrimination and oppression and of, of harassment are not going to be stood for at our institution, but then we don't do anything after that. I'm gonna let Michelle- Thank you for Michelle. Michelle. Um, thank you. I was really honored to be invited. Um, and I, I thought maybe um, when reflecting on how, how to frame um, my, some of my thoughts, um, I thought I would talk a little bit about um, my family's history and, and, then, and, and use that as a way to talk about um, ways um, that, that, um, that we can advocate for one another. So, um, so I am. I grew up in Michigan, and um, and and the reason that I grew up in Michigan is really interesting. My family, my family name is Sugiyama, and my grandparents were um, Japanese Americans. They were born in the United States. Uh, they lived in California, and our story. The story is really wonderful and rich and uh, devastating and difficult all at the same time. My uh, grandfather uh, had gone through undergraduate and medical school. Uh, he had done a surgical internship and this was back in the 19, late 1930s. He um, uh, then World War II hit and his family, um, within one week was relocated from their home in San Francisco where they ran a restaurant to the middle of um, the Arizona desert. And most families were evacuated to, uh, to the internment camps um, uh, of Japanese descent, were, were evacuated to internment camps with their communities. My grandfather, having trained in surgery, um, was uh, deemed useful to be um, to to assist the army surgeon at a different camp. So his whole family went to Arizona, um, where he where he could assist the the army surgeon, but they weren't with their with their um, with all of their friends and all of their community. Um, so it was, I think, very lonely for that family. My, there, my grandfather met my grandmother, who uh, Mary Watanabe, who was um, a, an, a nurse setting up the, the surgery there. And she was also interned. Um, and they, um, they were married in camp. They, um, my grandfather still needed to apply for a residency. Um, and although I have seen all of the rejection letters for residency, um, I don't have them anymore, uh, but he was accepted to residency at Massachusetts General and uh, where he um, became a chief in urology and graduated from that program. Um, it was a little dicey because um, they said, well, you can come and you can work here, but um, we're saving spots for all the, all the white boys who went off to war and you may, you probably won't be able to finish. Um, but uh, he was brilliant and he did finish. Um, and that, I think something very difficult and sad from all of that time was that um, my grandfather and grandmother never made it back to California, although the rest of their family and community did. Um, they uh, settled in Michigan where again, um, I grew up um, as uh, in Southeast Michigan um, and uh, was easily picked out as somebody who looked very, very different from, um, from most of the folks in our neighborhood. Um, they did not talk about that experience at all. And, um, and my dad's cousins, um, who lived in California really understood that experience and as the parents in that generation aged they really worked very hard to understand what had happened and worked um, 
through the political system. And um, in the 80s, uh, President Reagan um, made reparations to that group of people who had been interned. And it would seem that um, we had learned a lesson and maybe closed a door on all of that. But I would say that the very most important thing is to remember and not let that go and not make those mistakes again. And um, fast forward to the past um, decade here in Southeast Michigan, where um, there are wonderful rich um, communities of Muslim Americans who also um, have at times been under threat of um, being rounded up within a week, losing everything that they had ever, all of their possessions, all that they had built, their whole communities, um, and, and, and then undergoing that type of injustice. And so I think the lesson that, that I would like to bring is that, um, and that the other panelists have brought up, is that forgetting or ignoring is the is is the real can be a real problem and remembering and positive action is really um, the important things that that we can do and it's it's a long memory it's generation we can't forget those things thank you michelle i wonder what the panelists say about respond to people who say this doesn't happen here that's just someplace else. As Randy sort of mentioned, and Fermi mentioned, life, life goes on for many of us as if nothing happened, but certainly for many still feel it and have always felt it, as you pointed out. How do you, how do you approach the subject to, to people who may not be feeling it as strongly as you do? How do you, in your daily life, how, how does one communicate this impact without sounding, sounding like an angry person, as you both sort of you know, mentioned? How do you how do you communicate this, you know, the, the profound impact that this incident and numerous personal incidents for all of you have had to others who, who may not feel it so that they might also be leading this discussion? I think we all would agree, wouldn't it be nice to have a discussion on race and racism where it's the majority population speaking about it? Yeah. It's not just people of color or underrepresented minorities or et cetera. It's, it's everyone who recognizes that, um, the, the power uh, and the impact of racism. I'm, I'm curious, yeah. Randy, what do you, what, what do you say to that? Yeah. So, you know, and this has been something that has been a constant progression for me throughout my life because, you know, when I initially, you know, got into med school, even as I was transit kind of transitioning into residency, you know, I was, I was always hesitant to share my background with people because, you know, I didn't want to be looked at as someone who, they were just checking a box, right? Because I wanted everyone to know that I earned my spot. You know, no one would, I wasn't just given my spot because I was a black man. And when I went to school, there was, you know, I was one of five African-American students out of 120 that entered, right? Like, so I didn't want anybody to think that, oh, they just gave him this spot because he's African-American. But then as I started to transition, I thought about it and I was like, wait, people can't start to even think about change if they don't recognize that a problem exists, right? So I've, I, I kind of started to think about the way we learn and, you know, you can be unconsciously incompetent, right? And then to actually learn something, you have to transition from being unconsciously incompetent to consciously incompetent. And so I started to have these discussions with people who whoever I ran across, right? Like if you wanted to lend me an ear, I was gonna tell you about my experiences, tell you about the injustices. And, you know, I don't ever just throw things at people and say, you know, this is just my opinion and not give them facts, right? Because if you actually look at the country we live in, the foundation of the country, I always like to think of things in terms of real life situations. So if you build a, a house and the foundation is shaky, 
you know that house is going to end up crumbling over time. The foundation of our country is one where a lot of savage acts got us to the place that we're at now. You know, when Caucasians came here, and this is no one make people uncomfortable and it just says what it is. When Caucasians came here, they didn't acquire land through purchase, they took it, right? When, it, when slaves came here, they didn't say, hey, come work for us, we'll pay you. They took slaves and brought them to this country. And so if these are the things that our country are founded upon, and then we tiptoe around them, right, and never actually address them, then how can we say that we're building something and we're a prosperous country and we're the greatest country in the world when there are so many deep-rooted policies, institutions that are just rooted in racism, flat-out racism and discrimination, you know? So I think having those conversations with people to kind of bring that to, to the forefront. And then I offer people, I say, look, you know, go check this, you know, book out or, you know, read, you know, this letter, like we, like kind of what we talked about, the letter, you know, from uh, Dr. King when he was in the Birmingham jail, you know, or check out this documentary, you know. Um, I encourage everyone to look at ethnic notions because a lot of the ways that I think Black people are perceived in this country are based off of the way that we were presented in cartoons, media, you know, um, picking in these coons, all of that stuff, you know, and you, if you are constantly fed that stuff, right, it's easy to see how people can look at you as less than human, because when they look, turn on that TV, the representation of you is someone who looks like a monkey, when none of us actually look like that. So, you know, I think putting that out there and, and exposing people to it, so now they can no longer say, I was unaware, right? Because we all have a little bubble that we live in, but you know, you are now aware of the problem. And so you are either going to be on the right side of history or the wrong side of history. And the decision is up to you, but you can no longer say that you're unaware of exactly what's going on. Fermi, what do you, what do you say to that? Yeah, so I, once again, we'll try to be brief. I think that the thing that I've said to people over this past few days and weeks, people ask me, you know, how I'm feeling over these past couple of days. And they, I've gotten countless emails and text messages and calls from faculty, staff, students around the institution. And I've started to tell them, you know, I'm fine. I say, you know, you asked me how, how I'm feeling differently today. I say, I don't feel any differently today than I felt yesterday. I don't feel any differently from yesterday than I felt last week or last month. I say, because this isn't new. But in an attempt to pull them in, I say, you clearly are feeling differently though. So tell me what it is that you feel. Because if you now are coming to me with these questions today, something has changed in you, which is good. So then tell me what it is that's changed. Tell me what it is that makes this a heightened experience for you that then has caused you to want to take action. Because that's what we need to then capitalize on. Because all of these years, Whatever has been felt by the minority populations that have been trying to get this point across, for whatever reason, it hasn't stuck. And so this, I'm trying to go beyond just reaction and emotion and move towards action. Because the part of this that, you know, I was riding my hand cycle bike last night and I ran into a faculty member in the department of PM&R and in our neighborhood. And here's the conversation that I, that I had with her is the fact that if we think about this logically, really logically, it will be very difficult to then be able to convince the majority, the people that are in power and control, that they need to relinquish that power and control. It actually doesn't make sense because what has been proven, what has been shown, is that organizations and groups do not support the minority of the ones that do not have the power. And if we then try to give a plan that says, you need to turn over control to us, History doesn't show that the people then in control are going to support the them. So when we continue to make this an us versus them conversation, the us's that are in power are not going to give any sort of control to the thems. So what we need to do is realize that this is an all of us conversation. Call me the nerdy medical person, but I think about this in terms of patient care, right? If you think about a patient, we all have to work together to take care of the patient. 
the sort of age old metaphor that I use is that when you've got somebody that's in heart failure, but the person also has some sort of renal failure, the nephrologists want to make sure that they're hydrating the kidney, the cardiologists want to make sure that they're diuresing, and one of the two things is going to then hurt the other organ system, but you have to make a decision that's going to do the best for the patient. And so if the people that care about the heart are just caring about the preload and the heart and trying to reduce volume, then the people that care about the plumbing and the kidneys are saying, no, we need to hydrate. You cannot do that in isolation. You have to have a conversation together to say, what is the decision going to be? And so you can't have these one-off conversations that do not connect the pieces to understand what the underlying etiology is and how you're going to then move forward together as an entity. If we can do that in patient care, why can't we do that in taking care of ourselves? Why can't we do that in seeing that we are truly multiple Venn diagrams of intersectionality? Because when we do that, no one is left behind. Because if you think about me, I have certain positions of privilege as a man in this setting. Our data has shown that I am gonna be, as a man, more likely to be in a leadership position than a woman will. However, as a black man, I am not more likely because of my race. And then as a disabled black man, I'm even less likely, right? But if I then see that as a man, this is one of my Venn diagrams, but then I am a black man, it connects that. So I connect to this black community, I connect to the men, I then am a minority because I have a disability as well. I'm a foreigner with a funny first and last name, right? You start to expand all of these circles and you see that at the end of the day, there is no one that is not touched by those circles. And if we realize that we're trying to do this as a unit, and that this underlying theme of discrimination for the marginalized vulnerable groups that then may not have enough strength and numbers themselves to get the visibility up so that people can't say, I didn't know. This shouldn't be about how do you feel today? This shouldn't be about not forgetting something that has continued. And the other part is that there are plenty of people that aren't saying that they forget. There are people that are saying they never knew. There are people asking today to be taught why this is something that's important. The people that are educating our learners are saying, I'm not equipped to have this conversation with you. Now, I do not want to throw the baby out with the bathwater. I do not want to say that it's too little too late. But perhaps if we have people that are sitting here today that don't understand this conversation, then what we need to be investing is in the education of our learners so that in 10, 15, 20 years, we're not sitting here having the same conversation with a group of faculty that are talking about something that they say they don't know. Let us create an anti-racist curriculum for our medical students and learners and fellowship and residency, such that by the time they, they get here, they aren't also looking at the one or two black people in their groups and saying, can you please explain to me why you feel the way you feel today so that we can do better next time? This is the next time. And therefore, <laughs> people are acknowledging that they don't know. And so we also cannot blame the people in the positions that they're in right now because this wasn't taught before. This conversation in an academic medical center was not had in this way, so we need to give grace to the faculty in the positions that they're in right now because they're right. They weren't taught this. They don't know how to have these conversations, and we can't continue to put them in positions where then they are getting criticized and critiqued about the way they handled these difficult conversations that nobody ever taught them to have. So yeah, teach our students to have them, empower them, and do not also put all of the onus on them to get the job done, however, because we do, we benchmark this just like anything else. Other institutions have anti-racist curriculum. Other institutions have positions and places in which they're allowed to then have these conversations. They're educating people in a tangible way so that they can go out and be the ones leading this. Not a group of students that are gonna rally, not a group of residents that are gonna try to come together, but there's an institutional structural decision to say that this is valued, a priority is put towards it, and then there's a plan that's put in place. Everything else that we do here, we measure. We see if it's been effective, and then we have plans in place to sustain it. We don't do that with this, and it's going to be something that will come across as disingenuous, because in the light of this COVID-19 pandemic, when the African-American community was disproportionately affected, right now, when they were the last ones to get testing in our community, when they were the ones dying at higher rates, and we're gonna right now say that we actually care about this black community and we're gonna give time to it, the face of our black community right here is our Ypsilanti Health Center. I encourage all of our leadership to go visit the Ypsilanti Health Center. 
if you would then be honored and proud to film a video of Michigan Medicine and say this is the face of the black community and the care we give them at this time, I encourage you to do so. If you go there and you're embarrassed and you are not proud to put that on videos with Michigan Medicine playing our songs in the background to show that this is the care that we give this community, then maybe we'll make a difference. I know we have multiple institutional priorities, and that's why I know this is not an easy conversation, and every other academic medical system across the country has their priorities, but when you continue to show that it is not a priority, it is a focus at a time, but then what's gonna happen is we're gonna lose our focus, and it's gonna shift to something else, and we're gonna forget about that. So Ypsilanti Health Center, Community Health Services, they are the face of the black community and of minority and marginalized communities right here. And we could do better. We could then put in a health system, a health center in those areas to show that we actually value these communities. We have plenty of beautiful new buildings, shiny new buildings, clinics, multidisciplinary specialty clinics in other communities. Yet we make our Ipsy patients go somewhere else to get their labs and their images. We make them go elsewhere to do the, these are the communities that often don't have the resources to be able to travel to those other places, so then they don't get them. So yeah. this is something that I, I feel everyone that's impacted by this right now and that wants to make sure that they can remember, but it's beyond remembering at this point, and now it's about changing. And this is something that there needs to be a concerted effort from our institution. We are not going to change racism, and that's the problem. We cannot say that what our goal is at the end of this conversation is that racism is eliminated. But what we can do with our health system is say that we can make some sort of actionable change so that we can feel as though we're doing what we can within academic medicine at Michigan Medicine to move the needle. And if everybody then feels as though that's something that is important to them and that they're impacted by it, and we address one, the face of our health system and what we do for those communities, and two, our learners and how they are then being educated so that they are doing better than we are, I think those are two action items that we can tangibly discuss. I appreciate that. I wonder, Michelle, if you could, I want to take up a comment what Fermi just mentioned, a path forward. You know, we can certainly talk about the existing state, racism, race, conscious, unconscious bias. Are you hopeful? And Michelle, and I guess my, my thoughts are, what do you think, and I, this is a question to the rest of the panelists too, subsequently, um, what can we do that's actionable, as Fermi mentioned, in the medical community? And he mentioned some very concrete uh, steps that we as a health system and frankly, ourselves as a department can take. Um, but what do you think are, you know, either some specifics or general, general thoughts? I think most people in the panel, I mean, most people in the audience are, Want to know what can we do? I mean, in, in many ways, we all feel very helpless uh, as we see uh, our community suffer, our community suffer. What can? What are your thoughts? What can we do as a medical community? Um, so, in my head, that sort of divides into some short-term things and some long-term things. And I'm actually going to take the long-term part first because I think about that a lot. Um, orthopedics. Um, is a very exciting specialty. Um, we can return people to function uh, and our patients are generally very um, pleased and can get back to a better quality of life. And that's very, um, uh, gives a lot of satisfaction. Um, but when we look at the people who are orthopedic surgeons, uh, there are uh, only a few hundred who are people of color. There are only, there are still under a thousand practicing women orthopedic surgeons. And so, um, and, and, um, and I tell our learners, you know, what is, what is the, the, the most helpful operation ever? And I'm just gonna toot our horn. Um, uh, the Lancet did a study and said that total hip replacement um, has one of the best cost benefit ratios for people and it gets people back to comfort and 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 uh, and able to work and able to enjoy their lives and so um, that's really a source of pride. We 
we can do that for people, we can help people. Um, and then, then we talk about, um, you know, we couple that with the idea that so many people are afraid to come into the health system and have that, that life-changing operation, that, that operation that could really help them with their comfort because they, um, they never see anybody, a doctor that they feel comfortable with. They never see anybody that could understand what it means to go through physical therapy in their neighborhood or at their home. And so, um, so my, one of my long-term goals and the goals of our department is to really change the face of what orthopedics looks like and to really um, to, to welcome, attract, to foster, people who are going to be forging a new path um, as, as minorities in this field and to um, give them uh, the chance at this education and, and, uh, and then through that really help um, so many more people who never come into the health system and who could never, uh, um, who wouldn't feel comfortable doing that. So I feel that um, with in the long run, some of our positions um, can be to help change education patterns and and open our fields to um, to many other faces, so that ultimately we can help more patients. Um, and that's my that's the easy long term answer. In the short run, I think we have a lot of work to do, and um, and I think that. Uh, I don't have all the answers, um, uh, yeah. but but I do I do um, I welcome uh, the chance to work with um, the people in the health system, uh, the people in our department, and across other departments to try to uh, to make change at this time. No, I, I thank you for that. I think <clears throat> the strategy of creating a health system that's reflective of the community we serve. It's extraordinarily important, uh, yeah. Randy. I agree. Are you uh, are you hopeful? And I mean, I guess this is my first question um, about the future, and then your thoughts about what we can kind of actionably uh, kind of prioritize and, and do as a health system and as a community, medical community. Um, you know, I, I, to be honest. I'm yeah. kind of split, you know, um, I'm, I, I don't want to say I've given up all hope, but, you know, for me to say that I sit here now and I'm, you know, just extremely hopeful that things will change in the near future or, you know, 10 years from now, the based off the track record, I won't, you know, there won't be any significant change. Um, so I'm hopeful that people will actually use this opportunity to now move things forward. So I'm hopeful in that sense. But, you know, I, like I said earlier, I'm very pessimistic, um, to be honest. I think one of the things that, you know, when I'm constantly asked by people, you know, well, what can we do? And I agree with Michelle. I don't, I don't have all the answers either. You know, I, I, I spent majority of my adult life pursuing a medical education and medical training. So, you know, I can't give you all the answers about policy. Um, because I don't know those answers. And, you know, I, I know that I don't know those answers, so I won't tell you, you know, something that I don't know. But within the medical community, specifically at Michigan Medicine, you know, and granted, I've only been here for now, uh, you know, 11 months. Um, one of the things that I've noticed is that there seems to be a lot of department-wide initiatives, right? But there's not a collaboration between all of these departments that kind of, that brings everything together. You know, one of the reasons why I was so high on Michigan for fellowship was because of the collaboration, right? Uh, collaboration within research, collaboration when it comes to taking care of patients. Well, when it comes to things like increasing diversity in medicine, you know, I think that could be easily accomplished by establishing a longitudinal pipeline um, Michigan Medicine putting its money where its mouth is and actually setting this money out there and establishing it, getting involved in, you know, the communities that we just talked about, you know, having a presence in the Detroit public schools, having a presence in the Ypsilanti public schools, actually 
opening up a pipeline program to expose kids to STEM. You know, that would ultimately increase diversity in medicine as well. Um, you know, and it's not just becoming a physician. You know, you can become a physical therapist, an occupational therapist, a nurse, whatever. You know, all of those things would, you know, one, um, get at educating students, um, exposure to medicine, right, and to STEM programs, and then kind of attract those students along the way. And so, you know, I think as the institution, you know, they could be, um, I think that that could be a, a, a initiative that is taken up by the institution and driven forward. And there could be a lot of, you know, Michigan has a lot of resources. And so I think, you know, a good amount of those resources could be um, placed into that initiative. Yeah. Fermi, are you, are, you, are you hopeful? And your thoughts on actionable items, not only at Michigan Medicine, but uh, we as individuals in the medical community could do, or, um, or just things in general? I'll try to be uncharacteristically brief. So <laughs> I, I am, I'm usually the eternal optimist, but I will echo what Randy said for a few things. You know, we, we talked about this at length because we wanted to make sure that there were certain specific things that could be done. And I see some things that are coming through in the, in the panel right now and the questions that then to highlight. So there are multiple things that are happening at this institution that if we gave true support to and we connected the pieces that I think we could do a better job of. So one, we have the Office for Health Equity and Inclusion. The Office for Health Equity and Inclusion has programs in place there that in my opinion are not supported in the way that they could be supported. We could connect the Office for Health Equity and uh, Inclusion's programs that they have, the Career Development Academy and Undergraduate Research Academy that are our pipeline programs to the HOPE Collaborative that, uh, that Rebecca, uh, Erica Newman, Aaron Perone, the Department of Surgery has done as part of the Michigan Promise and bring those things together to then connect pieces also to something that we have in Michigan Medicine called the Leadership Enrichment for Academic Diversity, which is a program that starts at the first year of medical school, your M0 year. So everyone wants to then address this pipeline, right? And if we talk about the fact that there are faculty members that don't understand this, in order to then support the people that are the faculty members that, that, that need to know this information while also teaching the next generation, this pipeline is what we talk about. But we don't invest in this pipeline. I know that Dr. Newman wants to go down into the elementary schools. We've got Dr. John Finks with the Doctors of Tomorrow program that then has been doing some of this work. But once again, all of this work is siloed. And I think that we need to say directly that the way that this institution uh, rewards structures is not actually in a collaborative fashion. I think that we say we want to, but then the structure of it does not truly allow for collaboration. And it gives people the credit for their department or where that idea came from. And I think that if there was a way to better collaborate with programs, it would encourage people to then work together on something. So I do not want to bite the hand that feeds me because there is a lot of work being done here. So to be honest, I'm very optimistic because I see, I see pieces in place. But what I don't see is those pieces connecting with each other in a way because the structure doesn't allow for it. So if we were to create within this system something that could be emulated elsewhere, a program that then starts in elementary school where these black and brown students are being told that they can't amount to anything, where they're told that they're not gonna be doctors or engineers or lawyers or something, and they're just told that the only avenue for them is this one, right? I'll tell you that that was not my experience. I was never told that I couldn't do that. I was expected to do that, and so what I have in my head is very different than the little black boys and girls in Detroit that don't have anyone that looks like them that's doing this work that they don't even know that being a doctor, an engineer, a physical therapist is an option for them. So if we create these pipelines where we start early, and start to change that culture of educating this community that we want them, we need them, and this is something that's valued, and it's supported all the way through elementary school, high school, college, medical school, and then Michigan is the one that's known to do that. The difficulty is that if they don't come to Michigan or stay at Michigan, we see that as a failure. But if we are then known as the ones that are educating the next generation, even if they then go off to Stanford or Harvard or Meharry or, or somewhere else, they are part of our program and we helped that. So all of us as individuals today can say that there is, and I know that Dr. Rungi sent out an email yesterday or the other day that has two questions to ask that's supposed to then assist in the panel that's going to happen tomorrow. So there's a panel of town hall tomorrow 
where there will be faculty, staff, and learners there to continue this conversation, we can put in there what these action items are. And I think if people are gonna continue asking for how we can help, I'm just gonna give you that idea right there, that you support the education of our learners through a longitudinal pipeline program that starts from elementary school, that includes anti-racist education at the point it gets to for medical student education. And then you support Ypsilanti Health Center because that is the face of healthcare for our black community so that we can be proud of what we say we are doing in those communities of color. That is just the beginning of conversation. There are many other things. I know that's not gonna address every single person's needs, but that gets to our learners and that gets to our patients. And I feel as though that's an obligation as an academic health system, that should be our top priority. And family, if I could just interject, you know, while you might not have had that experience, you know, me and your friends, I've had that experience, right? I was the one that I didn't even think that becoming a physician was a possibility for me throughout, you know, elementary school, middle school, high school, you know, part of it is just not seeing it, right? Like you, can, you can't envision yourself being something outside of, you know, for me, it was, you know, an athlete or a rapper or something like that, because that's what I saw, you know, but I didn't see anyone that looked like me that was a physician, you know? So for me, that was, you know, more, the off chance of becoming a physician was not as real as becoming a professional athlete, unfortunately. And, you know, through pipeline programs, like we said, that can change. And I think that's something that really needs to be invested in, um, you know, because these pipeline programs can't run without money. And, you know, I think money is the one thing that needs to be um, put out there to support all of these programs. And I agree with family, you know, as if we can collaborate on all these other things, we can collaborate across departments to, to establish these pipelines and together we can accomplish more than we do as uh, individual units. Thank you for that. In our closing minutes, I'd like to offer you all an opportunity to give a few brief uh, closing remarks. <laughs> Michelle, we'll start with you. Thank you. Um, again, I just want to say thanks for allowing me to participate. Um, I think we all have a story and, um, and we all have ways that we can try to connect. Um, and many times that's the way forward. Um, I would say, again, I would say that remembering and not letting us repeat, thing, repeat our mistakes is very important. And then, um, and, and I, I'm going to just feel Jeremy's I, um, thoughts about um, coming together around something that we can really work toward. So if there's a, if there's a patient that we're advocating for, um, and that helps us to really frame it and, and drive our work forward, then, then, then we should do that. We, we are, um, at Michigan, we can do anything, and we, this is something that we need to do. Thank you. Fernmi? Yeah, I, I just want to thank everybody for joining. I, the closing thing I would say is, while this may have seemed like a one-sided conversation, I, I want people to really know that I, I think that this is an everyone conversation. I, I, do not, I do not like the way that this makes people feel like we are singling out, to be very direct, white men. I, I have had plenty of white men that have been the reason why I'm sitting where I'm sitting right now. And, and I do not want this to look as if we're singling people out and saying it's their fault, right? But I do think that we've gotten to a point of institutional accountability where we need to actually say, if this is something we identify as a problem, just like we do for anything else, any other like clinical diagnosis, we have to identify the etiology of this problem, we have to diagnose it, and we need to treat it. And right now we're in a place where we haven't treated it, and I think there's still some people that question what the diagnosis is. And so even some of those that then have had the diagnosis, they differ on what they think the etiology is. And so I think that we need to have those conversations with individuals because institutions are built upon the beliefs of individuals that have the power to move the needle. And if the people that have the power to move the needle don't believe this, all the people that are beneath them are never going to be empowered to actually change it. So I think that we need to stop giving lip service to this and actually having true conversation with the people that can make a difference so that this minority tax of having to bear this tiring burden of having this conversation over and over doesn't continue. But I'm optimistic because yes, I think this is progress. And I think that if this is something that we mean, we will not see the end of this conversation today. And just because like I've, I've had lots of people that have been trying to tell me, I've got to slide in there 
Another action item is about the GFR that we all talked about on the phone, is we need to try to eliminate race-based decisions in our clinical work. And race being used as a calculation for GFR is a project that has been moved forward at Harvard and at, at University of Washington that a lot of our medical students have been pioneering and there's a lot of data that they've been sharing with us as to how we can how we can address that. Sorry, just got to fly. Flies tell me to shut up. That's like the, like the <laughs> so I'm done. I'm out. Thank you, Randy. Uh, closing remarks. Yeah, um, I, I, you know, I think it's impossible to cover everything in this one discussion for one hour, right? Um, but I hope that people take away from this one is that you know this like Fermi and Michelle said, this is not the work of just one group of people, right? This is a work that takes all of us. And I hope that, you know, this conversation will continue and that three months from now, you know, we don't turn around and see that, you know, we have continued business as usual. Um, you know, I'd also like to say that, you know, I, I know there were a lot of questions within the chat. Um, I posted my email within, you know, the chat as well. So, you know, if there's anyone that wants to, you know, reach out and have further discussion, um, you know, this is something that I'm extremely passionate about. So I'm willing to do that um, and have that discussion. So, you know, I hope that people now, uh, as we say, a little more woke um, about the issues. And so now you can no longer claim that you didn't know. So now at this point, it's about action. And if you're not going to pursue action, then, you know, that's something that you need to reflect on internally. So um, I'll just leave it at that. Um, and I, again, Ganesha, I really thank you and appreciate your leadership when it comes to putting this together. Um, you know, this is an important initial conversation and hopefully it'll be one of many. Thank you. Uh, I'd like to thank our speakers for their time and openness and you, our audience, for viewing. I look forward to working with the other chairs to ensure this conversation continues, not just in times of crisis, and that actionable items develop that seek to help all. Uh, we will make the uh, chat comments available to all attendees, and uh, we had some issues, as some of you probably noticed, of getting the, uh, our, 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 uh, our symposia here today, our conference today, out we, uh, to everyone who wanted to log in. We will make it available on one of the Michigan Medicine YouTube channels uh, just as soon as possible to view in a recorded fashion if you'd like to pass along the word. Uh, to continue the quotation by Dr. King I mentioned earlier, uh, we are caught in an ines inescapable network of mutuality tied in a single garment of destiny. Whatever affects one directly affects all indirectly. Uh, and I'd, we'd like to close with the following message. Joyce? Coming on. Sorry, I can't hear you. All right. It will not play now. Fermi, do you have it? All right. Oh, you got it, Joyce? I have it now. All right. I'm a young black man doing all that I can to stand. Oh, but when I look around and I see what's being done to my kind every day, I'm being hunted to this prey. My people don't want no trouble. We've had enough strong gold. I just want to live, God protect me, I just want to live, I just want to live.